good afternoon, Alabama. We are going to finish strong uh, today. And I want, um, I want to thank your teacher for providing you with this experience. And it's an experience that will last a lifetime. You'll re you won't remember me or uh, my colleague judges, but you'll remember your teacher and uh, this experience uh, for the rest of uh, your lives. Uh, my name's Tom Bontz, and I'm a professor at Kansas State University, and I've been uh, kicking around with We the People for 30 years almost. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Arthurs. I'm a history teacher and lawyer just south of Alexandria, Virginia. I'm looking forward to having a little chat here on our last one of the day, and then I'm hoping you all will be able to go out and sample either Gus or Chris's or Sneaky Pete's. We've been having a sort of Alabama hot dog discussion. Um, and I hope some of those names ring true and you, you get a snack of your choice after uh, providing us with something substantive. Looking forward to it. Welcome everyone. Uh, great that you held on to the end of the day. My name is Luana Davis. I am a professor at Sanford University. And would you all please introduce yourselves to us? Hello, my name is Ella Wadarama and I'll be attending uh, Indiana University majoring in economics. Hello, my name is Jason DeRusso. I will be attending the University of Southern California, where I will study international relations. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hannah Shaw. I will be attending Boston University and studying economics. Our teacher is Miss Amy Maddox. Um, thank you for having us, and we are very excited to be here today. You are assigned question two. President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Do you agree or disagree? Why? What disagreements did the founders have about a standing army and are they relevant today? To what extent should there be an international US military presence? Thank you. Okay, thank you. In 2002, former President Jimmy Carter said, war may sometimes be a necessary evil, but no matter how necessary, it is always an evil, never a good. President Eisenhower acknowledged that the military establishment was crucial to maintaining peace. However, he expressed his concern that this military establishment would seek unwarranted intervention abroad. We agree with President Eisenhower's warning that we should be aware of the military establishment's goals and verify that its main purpose is to ensure liberty, security, and prosperity. We assert that the fear of unwarranted influence does persist. However, this has a new meaning in the 21st century. Today, the link between tech companies and national security decisions has created the digital intelligence complex. As we become more reliant on electronics, the boundary between intelligence and the digital aspects of our lives becomes blurred. For example, Amazon provides the CIA with a cloud platform. In 2019, Susan Gordon, a former member of the intelligence community, touted that this allows Amazon to be positioned for tomorrow. This is similar to the effect that as how our fear would manifest itself if we saw military spending as a solely beneficial way of promoting our ideals abroad. The idea of a standing army in the U.S. was first introduced in the Declaration's list of grievances. Most founding fathers supported a standing army. The argument was whether it should be managed by the national government or left up to the states. In Federalist 29, Hamilton argues that a national standing army is necessary to watch over internal peace. Governor Samuel Adams agreed, but cautioned that standing armies should be watched with a jealous eye, arguing that we should be wary of the size of a standing army. To date, the argument aligns more with Adamson's concern. And the question is, to what extent does the US military presence abroad truly protects the interests of the people? According to the Pentagon, there are currently 160,000 troops deployed worldwide and over 800 of these military bases. We believe this number can be decreased in key areas. And instead, we should invest in modernization as suggested by former Air Force Chief of Staff, General Davis Goldfein. International intervention doesn't always protect people's liberties, and it can also create international resentment. Former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley stated that the permanence of some overseas bases should be reconsidered. 
Although we should examine Chairman Milley's worries, the United States presence abroad in this interconnected world is something that will definitely be difficult to limit, but we should still think about some caps on the extent of which we use these troops. For our financial allocation, the U.S. spends about 15% of its federal budget on national defense, which is $700 billion, more than the next 10 countries combined. Many states and districts are dependent on this money, which incentivizes representatives to maintain a large military. For example, the creation of the Space Command in Huntsville, Alabama, will make our state more dependent on the federal military funding. However, we have to reassess how we invest in our states, and if increasing the size of the military is the best way to create prosperity in our communities. President Eisenhower's warning against the military industrial complex and its growing power has evolved into a digital intelligence complex that threatens to strongly influence the decisions being made concerning the United States national security and in turn, the deployment of our military abroad. While consensus on the management of US military presence is undoubtedly difficult to come by, we should reconsider the magnitude of our occupancy abroad to ensure that the military acts pragmatically and when necessary for the interest of the people. Thank you and we're now ready for questions. Thanks, team. And you actually mentioned uh, former Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Mark Milley in your remarks. So what, let's start there. Um, last year, Chairman Mark Milley was captured in a photo with the president after the president had ordered protesters cleared from Lafayette Square right behind the White House. Um, was it a good idea for Chairman Milley, general, he's also a U.S. Army general. Was it a good idea for the general to appear in this photo? Yes or no? Any possible harms? Any possible goods? Yeah, um, I don't think that that was a positive thing. Um, as we can see in the past years, how mil militarized or police has become, um, that we can see that influence in domestically of the military industrial complex. Actually, in 2014, President Obama signed an executive order after the death of Michael Brown to uh, reduce the um, Pentagon problem programs that allocated funding, uh, military funding to the police. However, we saw this order reversed by President Trump in 2017. And I think that uh, the Biden administration should go back to reducing um, the military armament in the police. Yeah, and going off of uh, what, uh, the, what Ali's saying, I think also, um, additionally, that the just the leaders of the you know, Department of Defense and those uh, sectors uh, should be less politicized and less, you know, connected to how the public may view our uh, the president and the executive branch. So. Okay, so we're getting a wasn't a good idea for for two different reasons that you highlighted. That, that thank you. Um, but then, when can the military say no to the commander in chief? And let's think of not just this example. Right, but are there other examples? Are there is there any time when a army officer can say no or should say no to the commander in chief? Any any situation at all that you can think of, or any any times? I mean, something that we can see uh, would be with the uh, congressional, uh, the legislature branch, um, how in. Congress passed that act after the Vietnam War in which uh, the Commander-in-Chief could deploy troops, but he had to, or she had to um, inform the public on the intentions of the troops in that specific region um, and the specific goals, or if not, the troops would have to be withdrawn. Um, I believe that the military should be allowed to um, disagree with the Commander-in-Chief when um, the orders will lead to an unnecessary loss of life because I believe that um, one of the most important things that um, we promise to protect are people's lives and um, and doing that should be one of the things that we should focus on. Yeah, also I think that one example that could be used in this situation. Uh, so there's the Leahy laws. They uh, pr prohibit the US government from providing assistance to uh, like units and security forces that have perpetuated a gross violation of human rights with like, so like kind of what uh, Jason was saying. Um, so I think that e even if the commander of chief or like the executive branch has requested some sort of, you know, entry into or any, any direction, um, there, there are restrictions that can apply to how we interact with those countries that may have violated some human uh, human rights laws with impunity. And so the, this is by the Department of State and Department of Defense, and they can, you know, um, have that restriction on um, those actions. 
You mentioned the Space Command, or what some people call Space Force, uh, that is forming or was uh, was suggested. Uh, and I'm curious about, uh, first of all, what do you, for the Space Force part of that, um, what do you think we are being, the military is protecting us against in space? Uh, and two, uh, do we think that that is, do we, can citizens do anything about the executive when the executive decides, okay, we're going to create a new branch of government, a branch of the military, or we're going to do something else with the military that is not necessarily coming from Congress? I think that rather than a threat, uh, the U.S. really wants to position itself as pioneers in um, space. So that's where that's coming from. And as to citizens, I think the um, Space Command, at least in Alabama, is receiving very positive attention because of the economic prosperity it will bring to the region. Um, and U.S. people by voting, they're kind of expressing their opinion on that. And so given that, isn't that exactly what some of the founders were concerned about? that basically people would give the military money, defense contractors, lobbyists, uh, and then the military would sort of expand beyond its normal or what we would consider to be its expected role into essentially another facet of American business. How, how would we answer the founders' concerns about that? Because they were concerned even back then that this is gonna happen and obviously um, President Eisenhower mentioned it as well in his speech. Um, so I think that uh, more broadly, just from just then, just like specifically from the Space Command, those uh, developments that we see currently, um, I think that uh, there's this, this this sort of like connection or influences between you know uh, co that corporations or have on uh, congressional actions is uh, we, we state in our opening statement that's an issue that we should you know consider and examine and see if there can be limits placed on how how you know significant those uh, in, in influence are uh, considering how those in incentivizes representatives to have those bases in their you know communities um, and I think uh, that, that what we said with investing in different areas, different sectors, and like moving the, that military funding um, towards more, uh, I think, areas that can provide more, um, uh, the, more like better ways to uh, create prosperity in those uh, cities and towns. Um, but I, I think that the... Uh, yeah, and I think that um, another point that you bring up with your question is um, how, what's the role of the people here? What are they saying? But we have also to consider that even though the military is expanding, um, the military is not just the troops; it is also technologies, as we can you know, um, as we can see with the development of uh, Ebola vaccines or. Um, or digital works. Uh, that is something that benefits us all uh, through the military which was one of the goals of the founding to create uh, welfare and to protect welfare and prosperity. Um, and in addition, one of the, what the founders were most afraid of was the military would become so involved in our personal lives that it would make decisions that would not benefit us in a way that I would see that we could counter that argument is to ensure that, as we say in our opening statement, that the government um, not the government, the military acts pragmatically, and we can ensure that the decisions made um, by the military truly benefit us. As a whole. So if one of the problems, you say that the military industrial complex is evolving, growing, you even called it a digital intelligent complex now that has multiple facets. And you also said that that lobbying was one one uh, problem. How, how can we address uh, the uh the time oh okay sorry dang it i uh i wanted to kind of uh, explore uh if that's true and and i i tend to agree with you by the way that 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 is true that that uh there's this relationship between um you know defense contractors uh and 
um, the the uh, the representatives and and senators uh, that that um, where their their plants are located and so forth. And so I I was wondering what you thought, how you thought we might be able to to um, address that and. You know, there's a, a variety of possible responses like campaign finance and that kind of thing, but we didn't get there. I did like, um, I did like, uh, uh, however, uh, a lot of your responses uh, to my colleagues' uh, questions, and um, and again, it's uh, it's a difficult thing, right? Uh, knowing so much, it's clear you all know a tremendous amount about this and way more than uh, the average bear. But it's one thing to know a lot. It's another thing to be able to, to synthesize that at, at a moment's notice and in follow-up questions, be able to apply it to what we were doing. And, you know, you did a pretty, pretty good job uh, with that. I mean, you know, we could, we could hear the wheels turning in some of your responses. It's exactly what we want you to do. And, um, and, and in fact, that's what we want you to do for the rest of your lives as, as citizens. And so uh, I thought you did a, a great job. Uh, I have, by the way, uh, been to Birmingham uh, many times and I, for one, vote Gus's hot dogs, whatever it's called on downtown, that little, little teeny building and uh, there's only a space for a couple people to sit. It's the number one hot dog place. Okay, that, that's where I'm at. So uh, excellent job, Alabama. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, team. I, I would echo my colleague's uh, sentiment. The strong answer, especially to the first question around Millie, I mean, you identified the militarization of the police and then also the risk of politicizing the military. Um, so I thought that was a very strong answer there. And I liked how you went further and pushed and said Biden should do the following. So I like that. Um, one suggestion, just as you go forward, when you know when you talk about thinking about principles, like if you can propose ways that you would decide, like what would be your framework or your indices or how would you decide? You know, a lot of things we talked about, like, should we withdraw U.S. troops from overseas? And you said, you went, well, does it protect U.S. interests? And what is the, and there were loss of life things. My suggestion would just be, because I know you're all going on to pretty very distinguished colleges and going to continue this kind of work. So when you're thinking about those things, like take a, throw out a proposal, like, we should evaluate it based on, instead of just saying we should do this or we might want to do this, throw out a, we should measure the benefits of this versus, right? Like throw out a, a, a deciding principle or something, um, you know, as you hopefully will continue uh, all at your very prestigious universities next year doing maybe not we the people, but something else. And hopefully we'll see you on the, the judges uh, dais, down dioceses. I don't even know how to pluralize that down the road, but thanks a lot, Obama. Nice work, uh, nice work making it through. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Same, uh, I agree with my colleagues and good luck to you. Um, and, and thank you for joining us for the national finals. Thank you thank for you. having thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you.